Hi there. My name is Vincent. I work at a company called Probable, and we host a official Scikit-Learn certification program. One that's made by the Scikit-Learn core maintainers, and it's also one that, if you go for it, you help fund the Scikit-Learn project, which is great. However, we did get some questions about what one could expect when they get certified. The goal of this video isn't so much to go into the material that you might need to study, but instead I am going to highlight just the interface and what you can kind of expect as far as the shape of the exam. You're going to see me do some multiple choice questions. You're also going to see me do a bit of a programming exercise, just so you can kind of get a glimpse of what it can be like to take a proctored exam. Now, just to be clear on one thing, this environment is going to be a little bit different than the environment that you are going to be using. I have a special Probable account because I work there, which is why the courses are free here. In real life, you would have to pay for this. But also, you should notice that there is going to be some proctoring software that will be required. We have to make sure that people aren't cheating. And this proctoring software won't allow me to make a screen recording. So for my session, this is turned off. The first thing you got to do on the platform is that you're going to want to register for a exam. In this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to register for this uh, associate practitioner exam, but do note that this is a mock exam. So this is not something that you can take yourself. The questions you're about to see aren't questions that you are going to get in your own certification, but it will be good enough for me to showcase what the interface is like. So uh, I'm going to click get now. I'm then brought to this uh, shopping cart page uh, once again. This is a mock exam, and that's also why you see uh, zero US dollars listed here. But I'm going to go ahead and buy it. And then I get a confirmation that I've indeed registered for a exam, which is good. I'm going to go to my exams now. And when I now look in this My Assessments tab, then I can see that there is this exam that I can take, and I can hit Launch over here. So um, I'm going to do that right away. I'm going to hit Launch, and that means that I'm going to start taking the exam. So I'm about to start the exam at this point. Uh, note, by the way, if you're interested, uh, there is also a dark mode button on the top over here. If you prefer to do it in dark mode, you totally can. But you can also see that there are some instructions. You can see that there is actually a, a time limit. So you have to do this all within two hours. And there's also going to be 32 multiple choice questions. You're going to see me do some of these multiple choice questions. But one thing that's also good, and that's also something you should expect in uh, the Psych Learn exam, is there's also a exam that will focus on a practical section. So you are also going to want to do some programming to uh, finish this exam. I also want to note just some friendly tips that are being shared here. Uh, you probably don't want to spend too much time on the theory bit. The programming segments definitely can take a bunch of your time, and the questions you got to answer for the practical bits also tend to weigh a bit heavier. Every theoretical question is worth one or two points, whereas every programming related practical question is two to three. Another thing to remember is that you should pay attention to the kind of multiple choice question that you get. If you see a multiple choice question with a square box, then it means that there could be more than one right answer. And typically that multiple responses are expected. If you see a circle, or sometimes it's also known as a, a radio selector, then uh, you have to check one and only one response. So before you start, just make sure you read all of this. But uh, what I'm just going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and hit launch, just so you can kind of see what you can expect. Here is the first question. And note, you can also see how much time I still got left. Uh, what aspect of unsupervised learning makes it more challenging than supervised learning? Note that there are circles here, so that means that I'm only able to answer one response. And also note that I'm able to mark this item for review later. At the end of the exam, there is an opportunity for you to uh, go back to your previous questions, and you are able to sort of review some items that you weren't necessarily sure about. But let's see. When I think of unsupervised learning, I'm usually thinking about stuff like clustering. And when I think of clustering, I also usually think of, oh, what metric is good? Because for supervised learning, you've got mean absolute error, and you've got stuff like uh, accuracy scores and whatnot. But for the unsupervised learning, because there's no label, uh, yeah, well, like, I, I would have to think twice about the metric. And if I think about like that doubt in my mind, then model evaluation does feel like the best answer here. It's not like computational cost matters for all unsupervised learning, it depends on the algorithm. Data pre-processing also just depends more on the use case. And weight initialization also depends more on whatever algorithm you're using, so it feels like this is the best answer. So I'm going to just go ahead and select that, and then I'll uh, hit next. This is a different kind of multiple choice question. Because there are square boxes here, we are typically expected to give uh, more than one response. And in this particular case, it's actually being explicit. We should give two answers. So how is a tabular data set organized? I mean, if there's a target variable uh, in a tabular data set, then that's typically represented by a column, not a row. So that one's answered right there. And a column represents a sample, and a row represents a feature. No, it's the other way around. So a column represents a feature, and a row represents a sample. I think that's the right answer. So again, I'm going to go ahead and hit Next. 
I hope at this point it's kind of clear what the environment is like for the first section of the exam. It's just multiple choice questions. We have some time pressure, that's the thing you're going to want to keep in mind. But one thing I do want to emphasize is that you can actually use the Scikit-Learn docs page as a reference as you're making this exam. I would be a little bit careful with being overly optimistic there though. After all, two hours is a fair amount of time, but if you're really going to want to answer every question by checking the docs in that time, you might find that you're short on it. So I would still recommend you study beforehand, but we aren't going to expect that you know the Scikit-Learn docs um, right from the top of your mind. You are allowed to use that docs page as a reference, because that's also something that would reflect uh, reality as you're working on Scikit-Learn in your own project. Now I've answered a couple of extra questions, and now we actually get to an interesting bit, which is that we're at the part where we're going to do some programming. Now, the way that the programming is going to work is you're able to launch a Jupyter Lite instance, which I'm going to do right away. And this is what the tab looks like when you open it up. If you were to type Jupyter Lab in your terminal, and if you were to do that locally, this is actually the website that it would kind of look like. But it deserves to be said that this interface is a little bit special. You see, this is basically running Python inside of the front end of your web browser using something called WebAssembly. That means that everything that's running here is running in the front end. We're not spinning up a back end for you. All this stuff is happening effectively in the browser that you've got. This also comes with a couple of consequences. The main one being that you're not going to be able to use every single Python package out there. WebAssembly might require some compilation. And in particular, at the time of this recording, Polars is a library that isn't going to work for you mainly because Polars doesn't compile to WebAssembly just yet. It is, however, quite likely that you're going to want to use a data frame to answer some of the questions. So that's why, in preparation, at this point in time, I do recommend making sure that you're aware of Pandas and that you can do some basic operations with it. Polars doesn't work just yet. So you can imagine that I have a tab open that has uh, code that I can run, but you can also see that this exercise in particular tells you what you need to open. In this particular case, we're being asked to open this file called hotelbookings.ipynb. And if I were to go back to the other tab, then I can also see that file over here. So I'm going to go ahead and open it. I'm going to confirm that I want this Python Pyodide kernel, and I'm going to hit select. And basically right now, this notebook should be good and ready to use. It also seems like I got to pip install some things first. So let's just hit play on this one cell. And although I get a little bit of feedback over here, there's not really a reason to panic. This is just kind of a warning that's happening right now. But um, I've installed the dependencies that I need, and there's some basic libraries that are at my disposal at this point. What I can also do is I can go ahead and run this one cell that loads up this uh, hotel bookings file. So I can go ahead and do that. And one thing you'll also notice, by the way, is that when you read the notebook as well as the question, then you are going to see that the question that appears in the test also appears in the notebook. So in general, if you're doing this exam, one thing I do advise is to actually take a bit of time to read the text that's in the notebook. But then once you start to see that there's also a question being listed, that would be a great time to also look back at the original question as well. In this particular case, uh, it seems to be that I've got this one little data frame over here, and we're looking for, um, is this going to be a binary classification problem or what kind of problem is this? Um, and if I had to guess, just right out of the box, I think that we're not going to be interested in predicting what hotel is being selected, but I can imagine that we're interested in uh, trying to predict whether or not someone is interested in cancelling. Uh, that feels like a thing that we might want to do sort of business case wise for this problem. So if I were to answer this question, um, this feels more like answer B. This is a binary classification problem. So I'm going to go back and uh, hit answer B here and go ahead, click next. And then afterwards, uh, there's another question about the same notebook. And if I were to go back to the notebook, you can also see that there's a, a little bit of a place here where I can write some code. And, and basically from here on, uh, the notebook will just have some stuff that you got to write. And the stuff that you got to write, hopefully will be able to allow you to answer the question that's in the exam. That's, the, that's kind of the way that this goes. So in this particular case, um, I'm being asked to uh, use a very specific estimator with uh, some very specific uh, settings. And then uh, the one question I get here is, hey, uh, what's the test accuracy of the model? And yeah, you, you can kind of only get the right answer to this question if you actually are able to run the estimator, use scikit-learn components as you would normally. And that's also kind of the goal of the test, right? Like we're trying to see if you can uh, actually work with scikit-learn. And there's a bit of boilerplate you're going to want to have to write, but once you're there, uh, then you should be able to answer questions like this. So yeah, this is what the interface is like and uh, what you can expect from the exam. I've not filled in all the answers now, but uh, one thing I wanted to end with is that when you're at the end of the exam, you get this review screen. 
And from here, you can go back to questions that you've answered beforehand. Now, one thing, of course, that I also should show is that if I were to go back to this question over here, and if I were to say, hey, uh, let's mark this item for review, if I were then to go back to review all, then you are going to see this star in front of it. So uh, this is the way that you can indicate that you want to maybe double check a answer that you gave uh, before you hit this final submit exam. Once you submit the exam, uh, you're done, and then you're going to learn whether or not you passed. But this is the interface. Um, there's a couple of multiple choice questions that really check the theory bit, but there's also a good chunk of programming you got to do at the end. And per question, you should expect that each good answer in the programming segment gets a little bit more points than each good answer in the uh, theory segment. I hope by showing you this, you're just a little bit more confident that you can uh, give this test a spin yourself. And on that final note, um, have a good time studying, and I hope to see everyone get certified who wants to. It's, uh, it's definitely cool and unique that there's a certification program that really funds the PsychoLearn project as well. That's definitely something I'm excited about. So I hope you are too.